Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today we're taking on what it means to be alone after your divorce. Let's go fishing. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Seth Nelson with my good friend, Pete Wright, and we're really glad that you're here and uh, hope you get some quality time with yourself is what we're looking to do during this podcast and talk about what it's like after divorce or on that first weekend, you don't have the children or just have time to yourself that you might not have had while you were married. Now, I wonder, Seth, I wonder when you think about your experience in your own divorce, at what point during the divorce process did you come to the awakening that maybe there would be some newfound freedoms in your life that you had not heretofore expected? My divorce was very fast. I got the whole thing done, I think, in less than three months because... I would never speak for my former spouse, but I think she couldn't wait to get away from me. So just be done. (laughs) In all seriousness, we're very close. We're raising a child together who's 16. And so I hope she laughed at that joke if she's listening to the podcast. (laughs) If not, I'll hear about it later. Yeah. (laughs) No, it's not so much within the divorce process, though it does happen Mm -hmm. within the divorce process. That first weekend when you don't have the children, it might be horrible, like, oh my God, this is what my life is going to be like. I'm never going to see my kids. Or if you don't have kids the first weekend, you're not with your spouse that you dated, you know, presumably before you got married and then you hung out and then you join your lives together. Now it's your first weekend without them. As you progress farther and farther away from the initial breakup, let's call it, or splitting or the time you start spending alone, I think people realize that you have a lot of time now to choose what you do that you might not have had before. So by way of example, I work a lot. I get into work early. I get home late. I take calls on the weekend. When the kids were little, I would try to do all the kids stuff and birthday parties and get them to their activities and go, 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 go. And I never really made time for myself, whether it was the internal pressure. And and I'm not even saying that my spouse was like, no, you're not allowed to go golf. I mean, some people say that, no, you can't go fishing or go hang out with the guys and watch football or whatever. Well, that's a whole different kind of freedom. Then you start looking forward to that. That's like why you get divorced. Right. In fact, (laughs) absolutely. Where I never get to do anything I want. Yeah. You know, right. It's not just about what the other person is kind of pushing onto you, but how I viewed being a husband, being a parent owning a law practice and just always making myself available and never taking time for myself, I found that this kind of forces you to do that because it's a weekend. I didn't have my kid. So I could either work the whole time or I could learn something new. I started to learn how to cook on my own. Literally, Google a recipe, figure it out. It was almost like turning Black's Law Dictionary into English because they have all these... (laughs) terms and cooking that I had no idea and would have to look up. But just to have everyone think about what is it that you like to do that you haven't allowed yourself to do, whether the other person was putting the pressure on you or you internally were putting the pressure on yourself. Well, and there are some people who thrive in the obligations that come from being in a relationship and in a family and don't ever give themselves sort of the time to see, oh, gosh, you know, if I didn't have to drive carpool right now, if I didn't have some sort of health there, I would be reading a book. Or I'd be reading, you know, Dune again, right? Something like that. Like, there's just, th- there are some people who really thrive on that. And I, I guess if you're not one of those people, it can be a real surprise that some of that time gets reclaimed. Right. And also, I think from my experiences, There are a lot of very successful women that put a lot of pressure on themselves to be a great mom, be a amazing person at their chosen profession, to be a great wife, whatever that means and whatever Mm -hmm. any of these great things mean to that person, right? And nowhere in any of those descriptions are, I'm just going to chill out and take a bath and read a book, right? right? And a lot of that is societal. I think it's harder on women than men. Mm -hmm. Nobody thinks twice if a dad doesn't show up to parents' night, right? Yeah. 
if mom's not showing up, what's going on? Okay. Sure, so sure. There, there's those societal pressures. But when you can release yourself from that, when you can release yourself from, I just don't have the children this weekend, or what do I like to do? So I encourage people, make a list of things that you've always wanted to do, but you always would say, I don't have time. What would be on your list, Pete? It would definitely include watch more movies. Right. You're a big movie buff. I'm a movie guy. And, and you know, right now, uh, unprecedented times and whatnot, gestures broadly. I'm not going to the theater a lot, but I've got, I've got a watch list that's, you know, yay long. And I don't have a lot of time to catch up on those things. You know, I mentioned those sort of obligations of sort of life and family. I mean, we've got two kids. They're in school online and we my spouse and I both work from home. So right now we have four of us. It feels like I'm in an office. You know, we're just busy and we cross paths at the water cooler kind of thing. You asked that question. And because of all those things, I don't even know where I would begin to start to think about what if I had more time that I actually owned. Right. And that goes back to a previous conversation we had where you can maybe go to your spouse and say, can you be on kid duty tonight? I would love to watch a movie. Yeah. That has nothing to do with your relationship or it's all about you needing to recharge your batteries. That gets to another question that I have here, and I want to pivot. And again, this is probably a more personal experience and observational experience. But at what point does that process become easy? Because my hunch is that you're fresh from your divorce and figuring out what that looks like, what that sort of reclaimed time looks like. I imagine that's sort of a, a reactive experience for some people, like putting on shoes that are a little too tight or too loose, you know, like you don't know how to own your own time because you haven't had a chance to do it. Absolutely. I actually think this breaks into two categories. And this is just my own experiences. But one is someone like me who's very social and outgoing. And then I was alone and I was like, whoa, what's going on here? Which is actually was really healthy for me. I am a better person now because I am very comfortable being alone. It's not that I'm not social and it's not that I don't like to go out, but I'm no longer kind of freaked out if I don't have something planned over the weekend with a bunch of friends or doing something. I will put on my favorite podcast. I'll start cooking. I'll do whatever. I'll listen to music. I'll binge watch some shows. I'm good. So there's that where it's like, I don't know what to do with my time. And so then, you know, some people will go out, go out, go out, but not really find themselves. The other is the reverse, the person that really loves being alone. So they're going to be like, oh my God, this is great. The struggle for that person might come later when then they're trying to maybe find another relationship. Like, I'm so comfortable being alone. It was so bad in the last relationship. I couldn't ever get alone time. I have all my alone time now. I don't want to give up any of it, even though I want to share my life with somebody. So there's always that balance. And I think everybody's different. I think it all takes time. But I will see people that I have represented a year or so after their divorce. I mean, actually final. They are always in such a much better place their color is back. They look better. It's not the strain of it all. I mean, it's taxing on you going through a divorce. And when you think about getting to the divorce, like how many years we talked about in our very first episode that uh, divorces are th on average three years in the making. That's three years of struggle and strife that you're trying to navigate the waters of complex relationship issues that aren't good ones, right? And and leading up to a divorce, of course, like that's a strain on your body. It's a strain on your mind, your emotional well-being, of course. Absolutely. Just take a moment and think about things that you've always wanted to do or that you haven't made time for. If you're a list maker, make a list, check it off. You know, you have those friends, right? That yeah. make lists and they love crossing stuff off and they'll actually already complete something that's not on the list and they'll put it on the list just put to it get on the, the list pleasure cross to it off. cross it off, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But make some time for yourself. I, I know I keep saying it over and over, but it's just so important to take a moment and just breathe and say, this is what I'm going to do. It might be nothing. It might be at this moment, I'm just going to feel sad that I don't, have my kids. That's okay too. Yeah. Right. I'm not saying like ignore that. Uh, I'm not saying that you, you don't go through these different emotions of uh, loss when you're, when you're going through this process, but there is a silver lining 
people come to realize like, I love my kids, but boy, I like my weekends off. There is a sense of just sort of exuberance. Like what are the things that, that you do that, that can help you find joy in a time of great grief? And I think people forget this, that joy can exist alongside grief. If you are feeling like the end of your divorce process was hard, as many people do, and are going through a grieving process, it's okay to give yourself that sort of physiological experience of joy that, that constricts the blood vessels and gets the dopamine pushed. And, and gives you a sense of rebuilding in your body. It's okay to do those things together. So if it's gator wrestling. Right, right. Well, I actually have one that everyone does, whether they realize it or not. They're setting up their own place again. Oh, yeah. It's an extreme home makeover. It's an extreme home makeover. I actually read this. It was on spending after divorce. And it was so stereotypical sexist where like, the amount of money that guys spent on electronics after divorce yeah. was outrageous. Extraordinary. Like, extraordinary yeah. huge flat screen TVs, right? I am already, like you just said it, and I realized, oh, I need to go back in this podcast and add extraordinarily large flat screen <laughs> TV. That's on my list too. And at most, I need like 300 speakers in my living room. Oh, it's going to be gross. Right. I always tease my son. I'm like, you have the best TV ever to play Xbox <laughs> on. <laughs> And then on the other side, ladies, it was a totally different spending, but it was on pillows. It was on getting their house ready, the couch, the this, the that, and making it nesting, feeling very comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. No man cave. Right. And I'm not saying everyone does this. This was one study that I read, but you get to set up your own place. And in fact, we might have a guest come on who's an interior designer who has been through a divorce. Oh, yes. She is amazing. She's funny and she's been through it. But that's just an amazing thing that everybody does. And when you talk about taking your personal belongings, mm -hmm. like I always tell people, and it's so sentimental, right? It's all this stuff, but there's something nice about just having something new. Yeah. That's just yours. You own it. I'd, I'd like to say for the record, using my using a legal term, did you see what I did there? I, I noticed that. That was very impressive. I was like, what record are you talking about? But keep going. For the record, for the podcast, the podcast record, for the annals of history, Seth Nelson, I would like to state this show is in no way advocating people get divorced. And yet I'm kind of planning for the man cave with the hot tub and the hundred inch flat screen. And I'm happily married. So okay. I'm just saying, let's define a term. Today's term as a as a little lead in, because we want to make things simple today. It's about finding your space again. It's about doing things that you want to do. We don't want to confuse it with any of this legalese. I scoured, I scoured in red Black's Law Dictionary, cover to cover. Okay, that's over fifteen hundred pages of legal definition to find one word. That means the same thing in legalese as it does in English. And here we go. Single, an adjective. Definition number one, unmarried. Definition number two, consisting of one alone individual. Full stop. We're good. Cue the music. <laughs> <laughs> now, because I am a law nerd... I will tell you that it did have single tax status and single condition and single beneficiary, but that doesn't really relate to what we're talking about at this point. So those are all fun terms, but single means unmarried. And notice that back to our original podcast, single doesn't mean divorced. This goes back to the forms. Right. Back to the forms. Single means unmarried. Interesting. Interesting. So when you are talking to someone and you're filling out those dating apps and it says, are you single, divorced? Here we go again. Just means unmarried. Seth, we've uh, painted some grand fantasies. I'm not lying. Grand fantasies about what I'm going to do with my alone time. But now we're talking about working with your lawyer. And I feel like using my alone time 
uh, just to sit in my new hot tub and watch movies all day uh, is probably not something my lawyer is going to a advise or b care about. What should what would my lawyer be saying to me uh, about how I should best uh, use my time going through the divorce process? I would tell any client, take care of yourself. Like we're saying, recharge your batteries on the weekends. You don't have the kids. If you are sitting in your hot tub, in your man cave, binge watching, whatever shows you're watching, I would tell you, do not post it on social media. Okay. Now, I know there are people who are going to have opinions about social media, but explicitly for the purposes of our conversation and the law, why should I not be posting to social media? So you see on every TV show, on all those lawyer shows that I hate because in my mind, I'm like, no, that's not how it works. And yeah, right. they're doing the trial scenes, I'm like objection leading in my head. Yeah, right. But in every lawyer show, it says anything you say can and will be used against you. Your social media post will be used against you. I advise my clients do not post on social media because anything you put on there is some indication into your life what you were doing, when you were doing it, with whom were you doing it. And it might be, Seth, I was at my kid's soccer game. That's right. But now you're posting stuff about your kid. And maybe the judge doesn't really like having a bunch of kid photos out there. That's an irresponsible parenting choice. It may or may not be. And a lot of it's out there. But I just advise stay off of social media. Also, Venmo. Have you used Venmo? Yeah, I've used Venmo to transfer money. Sure. If you're Venmoing, that's a transaction. If it's public, oh, I just Venmoed $25 and you put a bunch of drinks as the example. And oh, that just happened to be when it was parent night that you didn't go to. Yeah, it just makes me hate Venmo. Oh. <laughs> well, I keep mine private, but yeah. it, it's really... Why wouldn't you keep it private? It, it, it's that's really pretty boring. I'm like, happy birthday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So go enjoy yourself. I just advise keep it off social media because you don't want to give something that's very innocent to the other side in quotes. If you're going to end up going to a trial, anything else to go question you about or, or I mean, it's so evasive, the process of mm -hmm. divorce, you know, after you're divorced, you have a good relationship. I get you're going to post stuff. That's fine. It's usually, at least in Florida, you can always kind of come back if there's parenting issues, but it's got to be what's called a substantial change in circumstances. So there's all this other stuff. Do not, even after you divorce, post anything about the judge. Oh, they can come back at you. Oh my God. Yeah. There's ways to open <laughs> up the case when you post, oh my God, that I, the judge bought all my lies. Yeah. Okay. <gasps> Let's do a motion oh. for rehearing, Your Honor. Let's open this can of worms back up because look at what they just said. Wow. Right? Yeah, of course. You know, I got to tell you, that's the way I want the law to work. Like, that's a that's actually really gratifying to me to hear that. <laughs> that's exactly. Go, you go, courts. Oh. Right. Yeah, we can open it back up when you just yeah. posted on social media that, oh, that dumb judge bought all my lies. OK, so so in terms of the the social media safety zone, we're talking about the moment you decide, you know, I'm going to file for a divorce. I think it's too late. We're going to we're, we're stopping that. We know that the relationship is ending. We're going to stop posting on social media altogether. Yeah. And and we're going to maybe if if social media becomes important to us, we're going to maybe start slow walking our posts. Gentle posts back into the social media landscape once the divorce is signed and everything's done. They are final. Right. Because you just never know how that's going to be used. And literally, it could be something as, well, I don't understand. Why can't I post my vacation? We always went on vacations. I'm just yeah. posting. I understand. But we're asking for alimony. And now you're posting this great scene. And, you know, and it's just going to it's going to complicate things. It's complicated enough. And also, all this stuff is out there forever. I always tell people, please do not go on a rant with your thumbs about texting, right? When, and it's different in jurisdictions, but for example, if you're going through a divorce and you text me as your friend, I hate her, she did this, blah, 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 and you're saying all this bad stuff, I'm going to do everything I can to keep the kids away from her and you're going on and on and on, that might be in front of the judge. 
Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like the saying, like, don't ever put anything you down you don't want in front of the New York Times front page. Anything's going to be in front of the judge. I have a hammer that I actually keep at the office, which you might find weird being a lawyer, but I really will tell clients, I'll pull it on like, you do another text, I'm breaking your thumbs. Put your thumb out here. I'm just going to take the hammer and break your thumbs. <laughs> I'm going to break your thumbs. We're, we're speaking um, right. metaphorically. We are, uh, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, of um, course, there uh, is no thumb breaking on this podcast. No. And this whole, I unfriended somebody, you guys have a network of friends. Yeah. He knows somebody that knows somebody that you haven't unfriended. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It will. It always comes back. Yeah. And I would also tell everyone, talk to a lawyer in your jurisdiction, because some people now are thinking, oh, my God, I have to go delete all that stuff. Oh, okay. That could be basically what in layman's term is destruction of evidence because it's already out there. Yeah. And you're going through it, you know, don't start deleting stuff. Don't delete stuff. List, you know, listen, go get some legal advice from your jurisdiction about how to do that post, you know, that you've already posted and, and what to do. But all right. We ask for that stuff all the time. And sometimes it's not it's not pretty. So any anything digital, right? Texts and emails and uh Goodreads reviews and Amazon reviews. <laughs> Yeah, I once I, you know, I, I, I'm writing about a pot and my my wife would never let me buy this pot. So I bought 15 of them uh, <laughs> right. and I rate it five stars. And now that's in front of a judge. Exactly. And it's all going to come back. Well, why did you buy those 15 pots? Because I was listening to this podcast and right. Seth said, <laughs> do some stuff that you like to do that you were never allowed to do. And I bought these 15 pots and I'm going to try to learn how to cook. <laughs> So that's just one thing. And you would like to make as much as you can your lawyer's job easy Mm -hmm. in in the sense of you don't want them to have to defend every little choice that you made during the pendency of the divorce. That actually encompasses a lot in terms of our like the kind of experience you want to have as you start reclaiming your time and figuring out what it means to to be alone. And I I am that that seems to me as I'm kind of putting myself in those shoes that that can run into conflict with your emotional experience that I I want to share. I'm feeling exuberant. I'd learned to skydive while wrestling alligators today. Uh, I need to share that with the world and you can't do that yet. Exactly. And also be smart about where you're spending your money. Like if you've always wanted to take that trip, I'm not saying don't take the trip, but if you're seeking alimony, so you want payment and you know someone's going to be looking at your finances and let's say you just always want to do this one weekend away and it's going to cost you a thousand dollars. I'm just making up a number, right? But then you can then show when they say, well, isn't it true that you went on a trip and spent a thousand dollars? Yes leaves it at that, your lawyer gets up and said, what, if anything, did you not spend money on to save for the $1,000? Oh, for the four months before, I did not spend 250 bucks a month on X, which I would normally spend because I made the choice. I would rather go without X and go on this trip. And now it's explained, right? So just be cognizant in thinking of those type of issues and Everything in your life is on display during these trials. So don't give them more. All right. But go do some stuff that you've always wanted to do. But don't post anything about it. This is good stuff. It certainly gets us started. Take care, everybody. Don't post your social media. They're tracking everything anyway. Thank you, Seth, uh, for your time and expertise. And thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. We sure appreciate you subscribing. Uh, If you are a subscriber, if you're not listening to this on the web, if you're, say, uh, uh, subscribing in Apple Podcasts, uh, we sure would appreciate it if you head over there and leave us a five-star rating and review. There is just nothing like one of those sweet, sweet reviews to help others discover this show and subscribe when they need it as they are going through their own divorce process. Thank you, everybody. On behalf of Seth Nelson, I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next week right here on How to Split a Toaster. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.